Okay, let me also again <laughs> have my recording. So, um, so uh, that this is a slide basically from I think this paper that is talking about. Okay, uh, uh, it's actually this is a history from this three papers. So this that this paper is a well cited overlay. 5,000 citations, I guess. Uh, uh, they started the work, the direction of research to do visualization, basically. And they have this um, occlusion experiment. If you remember, like, we just occlude part of the image to see, like, uh, how does it affect to the casco and so on. And then in the same paper, they also mentioned this uh, deconvolution approach, basically just you activate some of the new ones and back pop back and to see like which of the new new ones are kind of uh, or, or actually in the image which of the pixels are correspond to the uh, active new, new one and so on um, and the paper they do a simple back pop at the beginning this is like that way right? if you have a uh, for example this is the value layer here so since you have a value layer um, only <clears throat> only when your input is larger than zero, you have a positive gradient, right? Less than zero is that like your gradient will be zero. So therefore, when you back pop back, so an anything that at the input is negative, the gradient won't pass back. So therefore, like here, this four uh, kind of, uh, elements here, uh, that the gradient will not pass back. <coughs> now, but... Um, immediately, next year, they have this paper here. They're saying, okay, this, this is not actually a very good approach because if you think of like the occlusion experiment, let's say, okay, it's pretty far away. If you remember the occlusion experiment here, so you can imagine like, um, for example, like if I, if I occur here, then I have my, class is getting, I mean, the casco is getting bigger, and Moku here, the casco is getting smaller. So then what, what you think of, like, I can think of if, if I am trying to back pop uh, the casco, let's say if I think of, like, okay, after taking this image as an example, if I go through the entire network, and in the last layer, let's say I have this kind of element here correspond to recognizing this is a dog. So now I set everything to be zero and then I back pop back. And then apparently this will be correspond to the parts that activates like this dog uh, kind of like new one, right? But at the same time, like, actually this have a effect also, uh, you imagine, right? But this is the negative effect. So these actually have the positive effect, these have the negative effect. So therefore, if you just back pop um, kind of naively, like uh, all the way, like as, as usual, then not only this will be showing, this will be showing as well, right? But showing as a negative pixel, but it's still showing something. So therefore, like uh, people argue that, okay, probably we only want to back pop when the slope is positive. So, or in, if for the influence is positive, so therefore, like if if uh, my uh, gradient turns out to be negative, I will just ignore it. Basically, I'm not going to propagate it back. So therefore, like uh, we have like a so-called deconflict approach that basically, uh, when you back pop back, it just looks like you back pop for a another value layer. So. You, you can think of this as an input now, you go for a value, basically just excluding all the negative elements. So, and then I finally, in this 2015 paper, they say, oh, okay, how about combine these two? It seems like this is a little bit weird approach. Then they just call it like guide the bad pop. It's like they will, um, only when I, uh, uh, the original input is non-zero and also like the, a uh, gradient on the output side is non-zero, you are going to propagate it back. So, and then for this guy, the back pop, they have a pretty nice uh, uh, visualization. It's like, like this here. They try different layers. Uh, you can see different, for example, faces here, dog faces here, and so on and so forth. <coughs> uh, and this is the back pop approach. And uh, 
Uh, people use this uh, to do uh, uh, some actual, besides just for visualization, there's some actual ap application as well. For example, like uh, that's one work uh, trying to uh, incorporate that to for cementation. For example, like if I uh, <coughs> I know that oh, okay, I'm going to visualize some kind of, kind of what do we call it? Uh, it's like grasshopper, I guess. So and uh, at the end, like you you can just try to find uh, uh, the where's the grasshopper right? using this kind of visualization approach, and then you have a salient map. That's approximation where is the grasshopper, and then you use a cementation approach, uh, cementation method in, in, in kind of like long deep learning method, for example, uh, graph cut and so on, that you learn in some image processing class, uh, let's say. Uh, if you combine them, then you have like pretty nice uh, kind of classification uh, result like this. So, so in the sense that instead of like you segment everything out, uh, you actually uh, only segment the part that is interesting. <coughs> so that that's uh, the conf, the conf lamp got a bad pop. Um, okay. Uh, finally, another visualization approach is based on uh, uh, optimization. So, and. Uh, let me just show you, let's see if I can. <coughs> huh. Where is it? I don't know where is it now. Oh, okay, maybe here. Let me if I can. <coughs> oh, I don't know why even that. <coughs> Volume all can be busy. We can switch back and forth between showing the actual activations and showing images synthesized to produce high activation. By the time we get to the fifth convolutional layer, the features being computed represent abstract concepts. For example, <coughs> this neuron seems to respond to faces. We can further investigate this neuron by showing a few different types of information. First, we can artificially create optimized images using new regularization techniques that are described in our paper. These synthetic images show that this neuron fires in response to a face and shoulders. We can also plot the images from the training set that activate this neuron the most, as well as pixels from those images most responsible for the high activations, computed via the decombination technique. This feature responds to multiple faces in different locations, and by looking at the decom, we can see that it would respond more strongly if we had even darker eyes and rosier lips. We can also confirm that it carries about the head and shoulders, but ignores the arms and torso. We can even see that it fires to some extent for cat faces. Using backcrop or decom, we can see that this unit depends most strongly on a couple units in the previous layer con 4, and on about a dozen or so in con 3. Now let's look at another neuron on this layer. So what's this unit doing? From the top nine images, we might conclude that it fires for different types of clothing. But examining the synthetic images shows that it may be detecting not clothing per se, but wrinkles. In the live plot, we can see that it's activated by my shirt. And smoothing out half of my shirt causes that half of the activations to decrease. Finally, here's another interesting note. 
This one has learned to look for printed text in a variety of sizes, colors, and fonts. This is pretty cool, because we never ask the network to look for wrinkles or text or faces. The only labels we provided were at the very last layer, so the only reason the network learned features like text and faces in the middle was to support final decisions at that last layer. For example, the text detector may provide good evidence that a rectangle is in fact a book seen on edge, and detecting many books next to each other might be a good way of detecting a bookcase, which was one of the categories we trained the net to recognize. In this video, we've shown some of the features of the DeepViz toolbox and a few of the things we've learned by using it. You can download the toolbox to this URL and explore for yourself. If you'd like to share what you find, you can use the hashtag DeepViz. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to seeing what you discover. Mm -hmm. So, um... This one, um, oh, I thought they just used automation approach. It sounds like they also use like deep conf. I mean, um, deep conf let. Uh, but uh, let's see. Let, uh, anyway, so you you can play around that if you're interested. And um, so, but let's look at this um, different approach. I like, instead of using conf let, uh, sorry, deep conf let. Uh, that's basically just bad propagation. Uh, we can also like just think of using optimization. So, um, wait a sec. Uh, so, um, okay, this this line actually, I'm not sure it's like right way to, uh, I mean, right place to put here. But uh, this this is uh, not exactly uh, a optimization approach, but kind of like in the same. Um, idea so <clears throat> oh. okay I'm not sure I should okay so this is a like the secretary and hey hi my name yes hello hi my name hello okay anyway Uh, so um, she typically only call when there's something emergency. So uh, I don't know. Maybe she will call again. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yes, that that this one is, but the idea is like uh, it's still optimization. Basically, what they did is like they try to actually Joe talk about something similar. Actually, this is actually the same paper of RCNN. This is the RCNN paper. And they also like mentioned some approach for visualization, and um, and for RCNN they use vision proposal. Right? They they have like lots of vision proposals there. So what they did here is basically for an image you have tons of thousands of vision proposals, and <clears throat> you look at the last layer. So let's say what what you classify for that particular class there, you just want to see like uh, which of that um, vision that activate most that new one and then when when that that one or like a bunch of them like uh kind of activate of them some of them will have like overlapping when you have overlapping you just use like uh long maximum suppression basically like you just combine some of the boxes together into one and that that show you some of this result that that's basically the patches that maximize the new ones for for images here i guess it's a like for this is not image that I think it's a like <coughs> Pascal <coughs> data set, something like. And um and this probably the first one is a like people and the second one is stock and so on. And um and <coughs> and uh to be a bit more into this uh optimization approach, um first first think of like uh of course, I, in in what we talk about in previous uh, slides, uh, all see like uh, what kind of which region is going to maximize a particular. I mean, to activate a particular particular new ones. So, a question, an interesting question that we may ask is like, how about the entire layer, not just one new one, but entire layer or and all the new ones in one layer. So, if I just give you a particular layer. Can you recover the original image, or like how much do you know, like from that original image? So this is just an interesting experiment for that. 
So people try that. So basically, it's like they just take it again like as an optimization problem, right? So you have um, <coughs> basically two different scores. Uh, one is just the loss function for you want to make sure that the layer matches. So this is the uh, original layer, that the true layer, the ground truth there, and then you pick whatever image, and then uh, you compare that particular layer and want to make sure this score or that that two matches as much as possible, and then uh, you always also like want to include a regularization uh, cost here. That it's just a like, one. This want to make sure that image look like a lateral image. So um, if you do that. And this is like for let's say <coughs> um, this is for I think let's see let's see yeah this is showing um showing for the last polling layer so immediately be before the fully connected layer um, and uh, you can see that from that layer so basically it's like uh, you know, like when you do the classification, there's you have a soft mass layer, right? So, and then you typically you have like several fully connected layer before that, and then uh, the layer we're talking about is like here, the last pooling layer here, and we keep all the coefficients here that we have an image coming in, uh, fit forward to here, uh, compute all the coefficients here, and now trying to back pop back and generate an image. And that's, those are the images we got. So, um, and uh, it looks realistic. And, and actually, what do you expect if I move earlier to earlier layers? Instead of like keeping this layer, if I keep coefficients in earlier layer, uh, do I expect that the image look more like the original or like less like the original? So do, is my question clear? I mean, uh, so for those these images, they are, uh, is that clear how they these are generated? Like this, these are generated when I have one image like this. I fit forward like maybe this is an Alex lab. Fit forward like all the way to the end, layer to the end, and in the layer like very much near the end, I kind of frozen this coefficients here, or like I store the coefficients here. Now, uh, to generate these images, I start with now. I start with some random images, and trying to match. Of course, I, I fit forward again, and I will have some coefficients at this layer here. I'm trying to match the coefficients here with the store coefficients, and at the same time, I want to make sure this image look like a lateral image through some kind of regularization. For example, like I want to. Uh, to make sure the image is kind of smooth and so on and so forth. So um, and now my question is like, if I install instead of like trying to match the coefficients in the later layer here, if I'm trying to match coefficients in the earlier layer, so do you expect that the created image will be more like the original or less like the original? Many people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> less, only four of you guys. I don't know if those are sleeping or not. I don't know. Uh, less? Less? More? Make a stay. Robert? Less. Le oh, okay. <laughs> you guys are all in court. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah. Actually, if you move up. Um, Think of that like this. This is like some kind of like process that you are going to lose information, right? 
So the farther you are away from that, you you actually uh, you you will be like losing more and more information. You're trying to you start from here, trying to propagate back to here. This is farther than like if I start trying to start from here and propagate back to here. Right? Okay. So therefore, if you're closer to the original image layer, if you th this will be <coughs> more like the original. So um, for example, you can see here they start with the, this is very late layer like FC A, FC seven, and so on. If you move all the way to the early layer. Like for example, this is the first conf layer. It's al almost the same as the original if you <coughs> try to match the coefficients there. Um, and, um, <coughs> and, and we can do something similar. Now, this time it's like not trying to keep the coefficient of the image, but let's say uh, I, I just want to maximize the cut score so in the sense that earlier i'm keeping say coefficients in this layer here right now let's say this is at the classification layer here now i have for example the first first uh first class is i don't know i'm not sure what's the first class. the first class dog let's say now i just set dog to one and everything is to be zero so then <coughs> presumably i can do the same thing right i can back pop back or, or like I can try to randomize, uh, randomly generate some image, start with some image, and try to force that image to have score like like this, have like only very much like a dog, uh, and not like rest of the classes. <coughs> and also I can impose a regularization cost, and um, <coughs> so it will be like this way. Um, and the result will be kind of interesting. Um, uh, let's see. The, the results will be kind of like this. Um, it, it's, it doesn't look very pleasing, but you, you can still like, see kind of like uh, barely recognize the object here. Like for example, this is cup, this is lemon, bell pepper, and so on. <coughs> but this is kind of our earlier work in 2014. And then like um, uh, immediately people like try some a little bit better regularization. For example, like uh, they they just, um, Actually, when they say regularization, this is like they write it as a formulation only. What they do is like they don't actually try to optimize this uh, thing here, but they repeat this step. Like they, wait, when you have an X here, like for the current iteration, current approximate image, you build it a bit. Like each time you change it, you build it a bit because like always the lateral image is a little bit smooth, right? Therefore, you build it a bit. And also, like you try to uh, set some small uh, pixels with small value, like to seals, so to encourage image to be less noisy and so on. Uh, then you get something more uh, kind of cleaner. It, it's like that. Like uh, this is flamingo, uh, and you can see like it's pretty nice, like pe pelican and so on and so forth. And um, and afterward, like the. <coughs> Yeah, that's more kind of like, you see like this is a later layer, right? They also try like, for example, like, how about I I go to la earlier layer. I just want to look at one particular new one of a layer, what does that represent? And they, they got some interesting pattern for that new one. Um, and then I think, <coughs> yeah, th th this work is kind of like from the same group as well. They kind of uh, continue what uh, we have just mentioned. So what they argue is that like sometimes when you talk about a class, for example, if you talk a class a uh, grocery store, there there are many different kind of images we we'll refer to grocery store. For example, like this is grocery store, this is grocery store, and this is grocery store, and so on. So <coughs> therefore, you just um, try to optimize and merge them like lively as what we did earlier then you will just randomly combine all these images together um so um yeah maybe get the patterns like whatever 
So therefore, like <coughs> what they suggest is that they have um, take advantage, um, or not take advantage, but consider the multifaceted uh, aspect of the uh, class of a class. So um, then, what what they do is say they assume that okay, I I have the class that can have more than one. Uh, one uh, actually, what they say, uh, uh, <coughs> um, one um, I would say we saw representative re representative of that class. So what they do is say uh, actually their approach is quite simple. Like um, uh, if you look at that, like I, I think you can understand that. Like if you you just read this uh, algorithm here. So for this part, what they do is say basically just tease me, right? They use Tisli to customize, uh, to uh, sorry, cluster the <coughs> um, the training images into like um, <coughs> of a particular class into a different cluster. So, for example, like for uh, one particular class, uh, I I would just assume they have like k different like uh, facet there. They call it facet there, <coughs> and then they like, they cluster into like k different class. There, like with with Tisley, and then I like, okay, they form this K cluster, and then when you actually generate the image, instead of like you start with a random image, you just use the mean of this <coughs> cluster. Let's say I I start with like <coughs> uh, cluster one, let's say, and then cluster one I have a, a bunch of images correspond to cluster one, and I, and I just take the mean image there and start from there and do the same thing as before. And then you mean that uh, get the result, <coughs> and uh, so and, and uh, this is a, a can a follow up work uh, by the same group. I I I won't get into this now actually because uh, they use GANs and I, I will talk about that when we go through GANs. And but just uh, I guess John I had to show you some of the results. It's, uh, really nice now actually. It's this is. Uh, Still, of course, like two years ago or something like that. Now it's even more amazing, I would say. So as you can see, you can create um, images like, uh, that is uh, rather realistic. Even though this is a, a little bit, I don't know, uh, uh, what's that word, like uh, abstract or I don't know. Uh, but some some of this is really, really realistic, right? <coughs> For example, these bird things. I don't know what's brambling. Brambling? It's a kind of word? A uh, kind of bird? Oh, okay. <coughs> it's a little distorted. Yeah, but, but uh, this is like two years old, two, two or three years old. So now it's I think, really. Uh, and I, I, I guess you catch the news, right? People talk about you can join a face and. <coughs> Just fake all this with GANs, but uh, yeah. So I don't know, but but that's that's actually is a, um, it's an issue. Like you you cannot trust anything that like you can see and read anymore, see and listen. Like everything can be fake. Um, so. I guess you guys heard of the simulation theory, also. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, it's nothing but simulation. Yeah. And people say like more than fifty percent chance we're living in the simulation. The the question now is basically saying that like they they assume that you you if you uh, we've continued to develop, there's no reason that we don't want to try to create a simulation. And once you create a simulation, you won't get out of the simulation. And when you're the simulation, simulation develops far enough, they will create another simulation. <laughs> so therefore, you don't know we, whether we are the first simulation or the second simulation or the, yeah, which generation of simulation. But because the original one is only one, so there's way more likely that we are in one of those simulations than the original one. Like the Matrix? Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. So, but if you look at that, like, I don't know, like for, for GANs and stuff like that, 
it, it's going to so fast, so quickly. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, this it's not it's not really very surprising actually. <coughs> Van Gogh that uh, <laughs> <will> simulate it. <coughs> this is a, a deep dream. They they start with the Van Van Gogh mm -hmm. like painting and then they um so um and, and you can play with that like just go go to GitHub and download that. Um so uh the idea of deep dream deep dream like forming this kind of crazy stuff is uh pretty simple. Like, it's actually just that much code, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. Um so what what the idea is is basically just like you want to reinforce everything that looks like that. So you have the model here and think of the little ones. For example, like let's say I have a particular layer and I say I, I want to dream at this layer. Then what I'm doing is say I look at each little one at this layer and then like and I look at the uh, which little ones is most act activated. And if it's activated, I make it more even more activated. So then, then we'll be enforce what what's going on, right? So I'm um, um, to do it, it will be very simple, right? So basically, it's just that, right? So we simply make the gradient exactly at the, as the data, then we pass it back. So and um, there's some tiny uh, nuance here. It's basically you you will do some simple regularization. So what they did is uh, they use a so called cheat twin regularization. You shift the image a little bit. And then when then you do this uh back pop and and afterward or like you do this streaming and afterward you uh jitter it back. Um yeah, that that that's that therefore it's really really simple actually. And uh of course you can play with that with every kind of uh lateral model. Um this is with the inception. Uh and uh I think this is trained using an image lat and of course image lats have lots of like dogs and cats like especially dog images. So therefore like everything you look at there's a good chance you will become a dog. Um and uh so of course you can use other I training data then you have like other patterns. Um, and also like you can dream at different layers, right? So if you dream at like earlier layers then you, you may have like instead of see seeing dog faces you see like more or low level textures there and uh <coughs> and this is just some more images uh and uh of course like, if you train the data uh, i mean change the data set to instead of image that this one I, d I don't know exactly what is this data set here but it's like a bunch of some data set for architectures so then you you see everything becomes architecture basically um and um and actually you can impose a bit more control than Deep Dream that uh, called Leo Style. I think there's someone talked about that before, like who who talked about that before I forgot. I either in the composition class or um so the <coughs> yeah, So Yeah uh, yeah, this is an uh, implemented in Torch, right? It's a couple of years ago, right? The I mean, you can still download that, <coughs> and I think you can run it real time if you have a GPU. And um, so, what the the idea is is that you do exactly as the name suggests, where right? you just want to transfer the style. So you have like an input image of some content. You have images of that provide you different styles, and you want to combine. Uh, the image with the styles, right? like this Gandalf here, like combined with this style, it becomes this Gandalf here, and, um, and, and and this is like image of I don't know where is it. Like anyone know where is it? I don't know where is it. Anyway, and then like it just combine different kind of styles you get, <coughs> <coughs> and there's just more example here, and um, and the way to do it like. Um, Honestly, it's hard. Uh, the, again, like to implement that is very easy. Uh, so of course, uh, you want to. Um, you you have two things, right? You you want to. Uh, uh, you you have parts that to keep the contents as what you want. <coughs> <coughs> so you have a content cost there. So basically, you have a lateral here. You 
you, you the image like coming in then you um, keep some of the layers that is constant let's say okay let, let me go to some of this let's, uh, let's say let, let, let's say this here um, let, yeah okay <coughs> oh, sorry I, I just uh, my allergy is getting bad and uh, I'm not sure because I, I, I'm doing foreign like for the last couple of weeks from my home so as I, uh, I, I we do like I just pee off this carpet and then I uh, and um, so probably like, get too much dust, dust into my lung or something so uh, <clears throat> So uh, anyway, like if you remember like what we have earlier, so we basically ignore this part here. So that what we did is like we 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 uh, uh, remember like what we have is trying to generate we generate images uh, with fixed content. Right? We we have content image here, and then we fix one of the la layer here, and then trying to input some random image so to match this layer, and then we say we can create some image similar to this original. So for the new style, we just add one more cost. Is that this style cost here? This style cost is um, is basically uh, we'll add several different layers. We want to now we, we are not trying to match the content directly. What we are trying to match is kind of um, it's still simple. Basically, uh, when we have the image coming in, this style image coming in. We will compute the um, the coherence matrix of the features here. So think of the features at this layer is some vector here, and then you think of this is a random vector. Let's say then you can compute the coherence matrix, right? So you compute the coherence matrix for that for for that layer, and then now you 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 this will be what you want to match. So you have this image coming in now. Not just you trying to match this content here. You also try also when the image coming in here, you compute the coherence matrix, and pair co co coherence matrix for this image again, and try to match this guy. And as long as like you have several of this layer match the coherence matrix and also match the content, you have this something very interesting like this one. So how to do this is very simple to understand. But you may want to ask, like, why matching the coherence matrix will get the nice result like this? Uh, honestly, uh, uh, there's a paper, I guess, like, 2017, so, uh, people just keep doing this like, for several years without a very good explanation. And um, if you're interested, I, I think that's one paper, but I'm not sure it's, um, <coughs> it's a, a very good. I, I skimmed through that like, just before the lecture, but. Uh, I, I'm not sure like that that is a uh, exactly a very good reason also but <coughs> but uh, you you can high level argue that like the coherence matrix that uh, what you did here um, is kind of uh, capturing the the kind of distribution of the image so the style is like embedded in the distribution of the features and uh, the content is embedded as the mean or something. So if you mix these two, you get something like the style and the, the, the content and got that image. <coughs> <coughs> so here's just some more results. Um, and, um, and of course, uh, you can adjust the, the two courses. You can make the content cost higher, more significant, or like you can make the style cost more significant. Then you can get like, a variation of different style image like this um, and you can also like change the style using a style of like um, the anti-high resolution image or like you can first lower this uh, this uh, style image resolution and then use the style for that lower resolution image and you can get different effect um, and uh, And you can also mix the style, of course. Right? If you you have like uh, what we show is that we have one content cost and one style cost, and we can like have like one content cost or multiple style cost. Then you can mix the style. Um, <coughs> and uh, uh, of course, uh, you can also mix with the deep dream 
uh, cost function also. Then you can have like style plus deep dream and like stuff like that. And uh, so one problem with like this uh, new style transfer is like uh, your the the approach we just mentioned there uh, is full optimization, right? It's full training. So therefore, in the sense, it's pretty slow. You may generate image with the approach we just mentioned, even with GPUs, you you may take several hours to create an image. Um, but almost immediately, like less than one year after the first paper or something. So people think of, okay, why, why don't we just say instead of, <clears throat> I mean, instead of trying to uh, generate this image directly, we can train a lateral to generate the image instead. So therefore, like we create a fit forward lateral. Now we're just trying to train this fit forward lateral so that like this fit forward lateral is essentially doing the same thing as uh, trying to minimize the score here. So, and if you do that, then the, the approach will be really quick, right? That's, that's, the, that's how people can do it like almost real time now. And uh, actually it would be real time if you have GPUs. And, um, and also actually this is uh, the work by uh, the uh, Stanford group like by Justine Johnson. And actually about the same time like uh, uh, Julian Love, like from, obviously I don't know how to pronounce his name, like uh, in Russia, they also have like very similar work, uh, basically very similar approach. And actually they mentioned uh, also like an, a second paper, like almost immediate paper. Uh, they, they mentioned that, okay, we, we can actually uh, improve the result a little bit, uh, the performance a little bit, or also the result a little bit, maybe more piercing. Uh, by instead of using batch normalization in the lateral, use instance normalization. So we didn't mention was instance normalization, and I, I find this uh, this uh, kind of like figure from Reddit, and um, uh, it's very nice uh, explanation of like several of this normalization. This is batch normalization, right? You have this is n is the number of batch here, c is the channel. So basically, like we're averaging, we just for this particular channel, and uh, over batches like, for all the pixels here, like height and width. And um, for instance, segmentation, we we're not looking into, I mean, normalizing over the entire batch, but we only pick one instance, one particular picture, and um, average over all the pixels. So that would be instance segmentation. Uh, sorry, instance normalization. And uh, of course, you 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 have other that. If you're interested, that layer long and like group normalization is just like that. Layer normalization will be instead of like normalizing over the batch, we will normalize over the channel. <coughs> um, I, I think I'm not 100% sure. Maybe you guys can take it up. I, I think the original uh, Alex Lab is like using layer normalization. Um. <coughs> So, um, and, uh, and that's not the end, actually. Um, the immediately, I think this is uh, by Google. Uh, they just um, follow up the work by the, those Russian fellow with like this instance uh, normalization. They say, okay, we can actually Instead of training multiple laterals for multiple styles, we can just train one lateral for many different styles, right? And the trick is very simple because we have this instance uh, normalization anyway. So when we train uh, a particular style uh, for the instant normalization, we'll have, we'll have parameters there for the corresponding like uh, gamma and beta here. Uh, then if we have like a different styles and we have uh, another gamma and beta, so therefore, like we just can train it several times, and we want to switch that style, or like we want to like have a continuous change of styles, we can just continuously like have, like do a weighted average of this gamma for this style and like gamma of this style, something like that. And then you you have a lateral that have multiple styles. And uh, oh, okay, I'm going pretty fast, but we are near the end, so. 
And then last thing I like to talk about actually for Charles presentation. I hope he's still listening in Tulsa. Adversity or white. Yeah. yeah. So he he also mentioned that like at the beginning. But actually, that the problem there is not just for CNN. Actually, many. Essentially, I I, I don't know. It seems to me like almost all machine learning recognition method that boils down in the last layer. If it's linear, uh, we'll have this problem because. Uh, if you think of that, okay, uh, okay. Let, let me just go through these couple of slides first. So this is just showing that like if I make a tiny distortion, I can create whatever image I want to the classifier to misclassify. Uh, all of this I will be considered as like ostrich, ostrich or ost how do we pronounce that? Ostrich. Oh, okay, close enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ostrich. Yeah. So um. And, uh, and that this is even worse, right? This is actually garbage, but still, like for the classifier, they will consider okay, this is Robin, and this cheater, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and, um, <coughs> and and the same thing, like you can have almost hundred hundred percent confidence is penguin, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is kind of not new uh, uh, for CNN or like machine learning. For example, like back in the early, uh, the last generation, like for example, HOG, like if you look at the HOG of two images, say like this is basically the same thing. It looks very different, but like it's kind of <coughs> have identical HOG representation. Um, and of course, the problem, as I mentioned, is really for the classifier near the end, as long as the last classifier is, is determined as a uh, using a linear classifier, uh, no matter like what kind of linearity you impose uh, in the earlier layer, uh, I'm not hundred uh, percent, but at least at least for like uh, linear classifier, you can imagine that you, for example, if you have two classes here, something like that, right? If I have something here, this is whatever one class this is high dimension I can just move this tiny little bit uh, and I know what is this direction here right <coughs> if I move tiny little bit I can easily cross this border and become this this class and um, and uh, for, for linear classification I uh, essentially uh, all the approaches for example, if you, you think of the last layer is essentially a little lateral and the last layer is, is kind of like a SVM, it, it's still a kind of a linear classifier. But of course, it's more um, subtle in the sense that in the last layer, the features, um, it's like pretty high dimensional features. You need to determine like where is this, what is this direction? And like, if I want to move to this direction, like how should I change the image to move to this direction? But it can be easily done. Because if I move to this direction, I can just, I, I, I mean, I, okay, for example, like this is my last layer here. I know that like, I need to uh, add this to whatever, like in this, uh, uh, how do I write? Yeah. Um, if I, I change at this delta, plus delta x here, I will be more like a ostrich or something. Then I can just, Take this as the gradient and back pop back right, as what we did earlier, and then we will generate those images. So, um, but uh, uh, of course, I I, I, I don't know. I, I guess I, that that's actually uh, one thing that we, we should just keep keep that in our mind always is like uh, despite like all the hype like in the news saying like how how great the face recognition system like is like uh, human like above human capability and so on and so forth but if you just move the eye and nose like here and there and they they just say this is still a face or like um, yeah you can just easily change the image somehow if you really know how to do it you can make that like Osama Bin Laden or something whoever like so um uh, 
but for human, it, it doesn't look like we can be easily fooled like this. At least it's very hard for us to recognize this as like warping or like whatever. Um, I don't know. If you guys say, uh, eventually we'll go into research and so on, maybe this is some of this direction is very interesting. You maybe mix with like neuroscience and so on, like really dig deep into like neuroscience to see why we, we won't get fooled by this kind of stuff. But uh, I guess I'm going pretty fast today. So um, just a quick summary that what we went through, right? we, we go for some of this visualization technique. So how to visualize CNN in particular, like uh, which, what activates a particular nuance in the image. And you can use that like, in any, many applications, right? If you can have that, uh, as we mentioned earlier, we can use that as a way to create salient map or like also in the YouTube video, they show that way. Right? For example, if you want to just have a algorithm quickly recognize um, license paid to start with, you can use that as a license paid uh, kind of like just the first step to recognize license paid way. No where's the license plate quickly. And because it's a neural network, okay, for example, if you use, uh, let's see, um, the conflict should be pretty quick, right? Because it's just one time back pop. So it's pretty quick. You can get the ceiling map there, like where's that? And then afterward, you can do segmentation and so on and so forth. And uh, of course, this visualization is huge now in us. Like I, I'm sh sure like there's an industry in that nowadays. I don't know, like, uh, most likely uh, all this us major needs to learn some of these tools now to uh, what, like, change this style here and there. Um, and uh, of course, I, it's interesting that maybe you, you can think of, like, research right? also, like, you can do, like, visual data, how about music and so on, like. Yeah, guitar. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can change this, like. Guitar, yeah. yeah, this become your China guitar or like a Yashiko guitar or like, yeah, and some some kind of like change or become pianos or whatever. Um, and we also mentioned this linear classifier there. This is uh, something kind of, I, I think it's very interesting because I, I, I don't know, I'm not quite aware like, uh, and any, very really popular classifier can bypass this uh, fooling mechanism really like uh, I, I think like all of them if you really want to fool them like you can fool them um, and uh, you think there's an industry in fooling you know <coughs> networks there's, there's a you know there's an industry in not yet but maybe it will be pretty quickly because you know you have this minority report society. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be pretty quickly also. Yeah, <laughs> people need a way yeah. to actually, <laughs> honestly, I just mentioned in class this, this afternoon, right? Uh, I mean, this noon. I mean, you guys would be well aware of this society now. I mean, I, I, I kind of ignore everything also. Like, I just kind of like engineer that. But I, I don't care about politics or something. But what I mean is, I, um, uh, Okay, I'm I'm on tape, <laughs> but I I don't care because I'm going to talk about. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure actually. <laughs> well, There's an industry in this. Yeah, I, I mean what I. Call white box adversarial attacks. Yeah, of course. Like this is a huge in industry here. That uh, think of like the power of faking everything. Like people are already doing that way, but then. <coughs> Afterward, of course, people like will say, "Okay, we have tools to recognize it's fake or something like that, right?" It's like security measure, right? So then, uh, then you have like this uh, again, this security war again. Like, you have like uh, uh, people trying to recognize fake again, like people trying to create fake stuff, uh, yeah. and uh, and and oh, uh, but it would be great. If if, you know, I'm walking down the street, and I, maybe I'm jaywalking. Yeah. And there's a camera, in it, and it zooms in on my face, and it tries to recognize me. 
pops up it's in China. Outdoors. It's in China. Already. I'm, I'm not sure it's great or not because in China already. Yeah. They have jaywalker, okay, they recognize you and they send you a fine right away. Yeah. Okay, you jaywalker, okay, I go back home, you got a fine. Okay, it, it can be either great and it can be either scary. Like, it depends yeah. on who is in charge of that. Yeah. 